but it's 12.02 and we, why don't we get started because I want to make sure everyone has time. Uh, welcome everybody. This is actually our last Cancer Center Grand Rounds of calendar year 2020 and what a year it has been. Um, a lot of a lot of things have happened, uh, a lot of great work. And um, it seems almost fitting that actually the uh, theme for our, our last Grand Rounds is our our division of hematology, and um, of which we are extremely proud. And among the highlights of all the many accomplishments in the division uh, was actually the, the results of our search for our new division chief. As, as you heard, we had a national search uh, and without question, there was one person that the committee felt very strongly rose to the top and that is Dr. Stephanie Aline, a recognized physician scientist, clinician, educator, leader. And, um, and we're just so pleased to have Stephanie now uh, in that role in the really extraordinary legacy of accomplishment in hematology at Yale. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie to introduce our esteemed two speakers. Thank you, Charlie. Um, thank you for this honor. So I'm really honored to introduce um, to of my dear, dear um, colleagues um, and friends. And our first speaker of the day is um, Dr. Nikolai Podolsev. He's Associate Professor in Internal Medicine and Hematology and serves as the Associate Director of the Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program. He's also the firm chief for education um, on the Duffy service. Um, Nikolai received his MD and PhD from St. Petersburg State Pablo Medical University and completed his fellowship at Yale in hematology oncology, after which we got to keep him. And um, Nikolai, um, Nikolai's clinical practice and research are focused on myeloid neoplasms, including um, acute myeloid leukemia, myelodysplastic syndromes, and in particular myeloproliferative neoplasms, in which he really is an expert. Nikolai serves as a PI for a number of clinical studies. Um, they're industry-sponsored, cooperative group, investigator-initiated, and um, in his clinical care and in his trials, he really makes a difference for his patients. So Nikolai, we look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for this kind introduction. I'll be talking about polycythemia vera today. I will talk about epidemiology, prognosis, and a real world outcomes. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so first of all, uh, polycythemia vera belongs to the group of myeloproliferative neoplasms. Uh, based on WHO 2016 classification, MPNs are uh, divided into uh, pH positive or BCR able positive, or also known as chronic myeloid leukemia, as well as uh, BCR able negative uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. And uh, among them, there are classical uh, MPNs, including polycythemia vera, we're discussing today, also essential thrombocythemia and primary myelofibrosis. So the definition uh, is based on WHO 2016 criteria represented on this slide. To diagnose uh, PVR, you have to have three major criteria on the left, or two first, two first major criteria and then minor criterion on the right. Uh, the uh, major criteria include elevation of hemoglobin. This is the hallmark feature of uh, uh, this condition, and that's what uh, makes it different from other uh, classical myeloproliferative neoplasms. The bone marrow uh, biopsy is necessary and usually shows pun myelosis, excessive presence of red blood cells and myeloid precursors, as well as megakaryocytes. And then finally, uh, there is one uh, of two JAK2 mutations, JAK2V617F mutation or JAK2 exon 12 mutation. In very rare circumstances, about 2% or less, when these mutations are not present, you need low erythropoietin level to diagnose polycythemia vera. So the um, uh, history of uh, myeloproliferative diseases is interesting. At uh, first, uh, uh, they were described as a group by Dr. Uh, William Demashek. Uh, he immigrated uh, with his family from Russia to Massachusetts at the age of three, and then stayed in uh, uh, Massachusetts, was working in Tufts when he described uh, uh, myeloproliferative diseases. Uh, this uh, group of conditions became reportable to SEER uh, the uh, large uh, registry of uh, uh, cancer patients in the United States in 2001. And in 2008, WHO renamed MPDs to MPNs. So from myeloproliferative diseases, they became myeloproliferative neoplasms, in part because in 2005, 
JAK2V617F mutation was identified as a driver mutation in majority of patients with TB, ET, and myelofibrosis. In 2006, uh, MIPL exon 10 mutation, another driver mutation of JAK-STAT pathway, which is activated in those malignancies, uh, was uh, uh, discovered. And then in 2007, another JAK2 mutation, JAK2 exon 12 mutation, was described. Finally, in 2013, calreticulin mutation uh, uh, was uh, uh, described. And if you look at polycythemia vera, which is the subject uh, of my presentation today, most of the patients will have uh, JAK2V617F mutation, 97%. 1% uh, will have JAK2 exon 12, and then 2% uh, of patients will have other drivers. So uh, the uh, polycythemia vera epidemiology um, was recently summarized in our review. As you can see, uh, the uh, patients uh, with this uh, diagnosis are older. Median age diagnosis is 65 years. Uh, it's not the, the most common malignancy. Uh, the incidence is only 0.5 to 4 per 100,000 person years. Estimated prevalence in the US is 25 to 57 per 100,000 persons. And median overall survival is 12 to 14 years, which is less than expected uh, in age uh, and gender matched population. Five year relative survival is 84 to 89%. Uh, so if you look at this graph, you will appreciate that uh, males um, uh, are diagnosed with this condition a little bit more common than females. You can see males are in blue. Uh, this is divided in different age groups. One other thing you can appreciate here is that uh, this condition is extremely uh, rarely diagnosed in younger patients, those who are, uh, who are younger than 40. So this is um, uh, one of the large cohort studies uh, in one institution in Mayo Clinic, which looked at survival of patients with classical myeloproliferative neoplasms. And here you can appreciate that ET uh, survival, the yellow line, is uh, uh, less than survival of uh, general population, the dark blue line, and uh, polycythemia vera in red is worse uh, survival than ET. Uh, so the etiology uh, of uh, myeloproliferative uh, neoplasms goes beyond driver mutations. We know the driver mutations. We also uh, just figured out that they may occur many, many years before MPN diagnosis. During this uh, ASH meeting a week ago, there was a presentation uh, which showed that uh, these mutations may uh, uh, develop in utero. But factors leading to the acquisition and development of MPN are much less clear. So in fact, MPN doesn't develop in everyone uh, who has JAK2 mutations. Uh, the other uh, interesting observation is that uh, there is higher uh, incidence of uh, MPNs in first degree relatives. It's actually seven times more likely. Uh, uh, the patient's uh, first degree relatives are seven times more likely to develop MPNs. And uh, germline and driver mutations in JAK2 calorie and nipple genes are uncommon. It is felt that congenital predisposition due to certain polymorphisms help to acquire MPN in families. Overall, we think five to 10% of MPN patients have germline predisposition. So we studied uh, uh, extrinsic factors influencing uh, on the development of polycythemia vera among other myeloproliferative neoplasms. And for that, we used an IHARP diet and health study cohort uh, with uh, more than 450,000 participants. Uh, median follow-up uh, was 15 and a half years uh, 490 MPN cases uh, were uh, discovered, among them 190 PV cases. So uh, it is well known that tobacco is a bad carcinogen, and we uh, were able to show that there is increased risk of MPN development among uh, smoking women. So the other interesting finding of the study was uh, uh, identification of uh, coffee uh, intake as a uh, protective uh, against development of uh, polycythemia vera. You can see that high versus low coffee intake was associated with uh, decreased incidence of that diagnosis. Consumption of decaffeinated coffee did not have protective effect. Uh, we also looked at uh, uh, different uh, macronutrients and uh, 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 food groups and identified food consumption as one of the risks of the development of PV. as well as sugar intake, uh, which is also associated with thymia vera. So to conclude, uh, uh, it's good to have a cup of coffee in the morning, but uh, not with sugar and uh, without a cigarette. 
So uh, the common clinical features uh, of polycythemia vera include microvascular complications like headache, erythromyalgia, dizziness, prosthesias, and blurred vision. Microvascular complications, uh, including heart attacks, uh, strokes, and venous thrombotic events. Uh, patients with PME may suffer from constitutional symptoms, including fatigue, night sweats, weight loss, and itching, specifically aquagenic pruritus. Uh, splenomegaly uh, occurs in less than half of the patients, and uh, patients with PV may have uh, splenomegaly-associated symptoms as well. Uh, most of morbidity and mortality in this group of patients uh, comes from uh, uh, thrombosis. Arterial and venous thrombosis occur in about 20% uh, of patients. Uh, you can see that this is the data from cohort of more than 1,500 patients with a mean follow-up of 6.9 years. But not only thromb thrombosis is the danger, uh, these patients can also develop major hemorrhage. And uh, it is known that polycythemia vera is thrombohemorrhagic disorder. So what is feared most is uh, uh, disease progression. And uh, uh, patients with polycythemia may progress to post-PV myelofibrosis, about 10% of patients in 10 years. Uh, but uh, uh, even more scary with the progression to uh, blast phase of myeloproliferative neoplasm or secondary acute myeloid leukemia. As you can see, 4% uh, of uh, PV patients will develop AML after 10 years of follow-up. It is uh, a little bit more than AT, but much less than in primary myelofibrosis. So um, uh, also, uh, we sometimes can observe evolution of essential thrombocythemia, uh, jak 2 v 617 f mutation positive to polycythemia vera. Can we predict the risk of disease evolution? Uh, can we predict uh, progression to myelofibrosis or acute myeloid leukemia? So uh, uh, we participated in this multi-center study, uh, which looked at the largest US-based PV data set. Uh, we contributed 100 patients to this 520 patient cohort. And what we looked at is uh, uh, leukocytosis over a year and its association with disease evolution and uh, thrombosis. It turns out that uh, this uh, um, uh, white cell count trajectory uh, did not associate with uh, thrombosis, but uh, was associated with increased risk of transformation to post-PV uh, myelofibrosis, as well as MDS and acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, this study uh, used very interesting statistical approach, uh, so-called group-based trajectory modeling, uh, which is usually in, uh, used in social and behavioral sciences. And uh, uh, this allowed to capture infrequent or delayed uh, phenomena from the landmark start point over the course of the disease, as opposed to other studies which looked at leukocytosis at one time point. So is uh, WBC increase a surrogate marker or of disease evolution potential, or is a prompt for cytoreduction reduction allowing us to prevent it? Uh, this particular question is not answered yet. Uh, I am uh, privileged to represent our cancer center uh, on NCCN guideline panel, uh, developing guidelines for myeloproliferative neoplasm. And I'm going to uh, show you the uh, section which is uh, related to uh, management of polycythemia vera. So the goals of management is to reduce the risk of thrombosis and hemorrhage, control the symptoms and try to prevent and delay uh, disease transformation. Everyone with a diagnosis of PV uh, should be uh, receiving low-dose aspirin, uh, as well as be phlebotomized to hematocrit goal of less than five, uh, 45%. Uh, cardiovascular risk factors have to be managed as well as, this, as cardiovascular morbidity and mortality is common among these patients. So the uh, evidence behind aspirin uh, in polycythemia vera comes from this study, which was published in 2004 in New England Journal of Medicine. This is so-called ECLAP study evaluation uh, of um, uh, aspirin in polycythemia. And uh, it looked at probability of survival free of myocardial infarction and stroke and death from cardiovascular causes, as well as P and DVT. That was the combined endpoint. Uh, the aspirin users, as opposed to placebo users, uh, had 60% uh, risk reduction of adverse events. And um, incidence uh, of major bleeding episodes was not significantly different in this low dose aspirin group. So the next recommendation in the guidelines is to keep hematocrit below 45%. Uh, the study which was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 confirmed this goal, which we actually uh, using in practice for many years, even before this article was published. 
uh, it turns out that this uh, stricter control of hematocrit using phlebotomies as well as cytoreductive therapies is associated with uh, uh, four times decreased risk of uh, thrombotic events. So in regards to management of cardiovascular risk factors, uh, uh, our group uh, looked at use of statins and survival among older patients with polycythemia vera uh, using serum medicator, a Medicare data set. So we identified um, 721 polycythemia vera patients. A little bit more half of them use statins after diagnosis. Using univariate analysis on the left, we showed that statin users uh, had improved survival. Uh, in multivariate analysis, we also showed that uh, uh, proportion of days covered uh, by 10, increase of proportion of days covered by 10% led to uh, reduction of risk of death by 18%. So statins are certainly beneficial uh, for this group of patients, all the patients with polycythemia vera. So uh, the uh, center of the algorithm uh, of uh, management of patients with polycythemia is their risk, class, uh, risk stratification uh, based on ELN criteria. So patients are considered high risk for thrombotic events, arterial and venous, if they're older than 60 or if they had history of thrombosis. So this patient's beyond aspirin phlebotomy to hematocrit less than 45 and modification of cardiovascular risk factors should be on cytoreductive therapy. And um, the frontline therapy recommended to these patients is either hydroxyurea or interferon. So um, of course, if uh, uh, patients are not high risk and they develop worsening of symptoms, uh, they have new thrombotic events or bleeding events, they do not tolerate phlebotomy, which they continuously require, or they have elevated white cell count, as well as platelet count, cytoreductive therapy may be used as well. So um, uh, there are no randomized studies looking at hydroxyurea in patients with polycythemia vera. Uh, the uh, reason why we're using it is mostly extrapolation from the studies which were done for essential thrombocytemia uh, patients. So we looked at uh, uh, the 820 uh, older patients with PV, once again, using CR Medicare, Medicare data set and uh, found out that about 40% of those patients uh, who are high risk are under it. Uh, and um, looking at uh, the treatment with uh, phlebotomy and specifically with hydroxyurea, uh, we found out that every 10% 10 per, 10 increase in proportion of days covered uh, by hydroxyurea led to uh, decreased risk of death by 8%. Similarly, uh, increase um, of PTC by 10%. Uh, led to decrease of thrombosis uh, uh, by 8%. So this is certainly an effective treatment which not only uh, helps to prevent thrombotic events, but also improves survival in older patients uh, with polycythemia vera. As you can see, the benefit of phlebotomy was also confirmed in this study. So why hydroxyurea works uh, for PV patients? It's an oral chemotherapeutic agent that inhibits like uh, ribonucleotide reductase and interferes with the process of DNA synthesis and repair. It is uh, uh, cheap uh, and has a reasonably favorable toxicity profile as well as long-term safety data, including in uh, children with sickle cell disease. Uh, its mechanism of action uh, in uh, PV is debated, but may include impact on blood counts, ability to reduce neutrophil activity, decrease expression of endothelial adhesion molecules, and in use of nitric oxide generation. Uh, side effects occur and the drug is not tolerated by about 20% of patients. The side effects include myelosuppression, mucocutaneous ulcers, non-melanoma skin cancers. It is also teratogenic. So the big question uh, which is still um, uh, debated uh, uh, during uh, MPN meetings and uh, uh, on the pages of uh, publications is uh, hydroxyurea relationship with second malignancies. Does hydroxyurea increase risk of second malignancies? We, um, again, use CIR Medicare uh, data set to uh, look at second malignancies in one MPN patients. Um, as you can see, uh, we studied more than 3,000 patients and uh, about 40% of them had polycythemia vera. Uh, these patients were followed up to 10 years. Median follow-up was 2.67 years and median age of diagnosis was 77 years. So it's a little bit older than general PV population because of uh, uh, Medicare requirement for this study. Uh, so 65% uh, of patients used hydroxyurea 
allowing us to look at two groups, hydroxyurea users and non-users. It is well known that uh, second malignancies uh, are common in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. It is not really clear exactly why that is, but you can see that in our cohort of patients, uh, about 8.8% developed uh, second malignancy, more than half solid second malignancies and uh, uh, among patients with hematological malignancies, majority developed AML and MDS as expected in this group uh, of patients with uh, myeloid neoplasms. So uh, when we compare two groups, hydroxyurea users and non-users using univariate analysis, uh, we found uh, no difference in incidence of second malignancies. In the multivariable analysis of hydroxyurea use and uh, uh, type of uh, second malignancies, we found uh, no difference in occurrence of all second malignancies, solid second malignancies, and hematologic non-myeloid second malignancies. We also did an analysis specifically aimed at myeloid uh, second malignancies, and there was no difference here either. So uh, moving on on this algorithm, uh, if uh, cytoreductive therapy stops working or is not tolerated, uh, uh, we have an option of second-line cytoreduction with ruxolitinib, which is the only FDA-approved drug, by the way, in polycythemia vera, neither hydroxyurea nor interferon are approved at this time in the United States by the FDA. So uh, the interferon is used in uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms for many years, uh, and uh, it is associated with decently high rates of hematological response uh, reduction and independence from phlebotomies, improvement of symptoms, and in some patients, up to 30%, uh, significant reduction and disappearance of JAK2 V617F uh, positive cells. Side effects uh, include uh, uh, flu like symptoms, uh, psychiatric conditions, and that's why this drug is not uh, given to patients with psychiatric disorders, as well as autoimmune side effects. Side effects are better. Uh, with pegylated preparations, which can be given once a week. One other thing which is quite important, this drug is not teratogenic and is preferred uh, for younger patients with PVRA. Uh, so uh, it has potential for disease modification by targeting the malignant clone, which is evidenced by disappearance of JAK2 V617F positive cells in some of those patients. Uh, we conducted this meta-analysis of 41 studies, uh, including 1,281 patients. Uh, more than 500 of them had PV. Uh, the overall response rate uh, was 75% with complete hematological response of 50%. In meta-regression analysis, there was no, different from, uh, between, no difference between non-pegylated and pegylated interference in regards to response rates uh, and uh, uh, thromboembolic events and uh, treatment discontinuation due to adverse events were not frequent, 0.5% and 6.5% per year. Uh, respectively. Molecular responses, which is certainly interesting because we hope that this drug is disease modifying, could not be analyzed in this particular meta-analysis due to heterogeneity of definition and outcome assessments. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we thought that both pegylated interferon and non-pegylated interferon can be effective and safe long-term in PVERA patients. So this is the response study which led to FDA approval of uh, uh, JAK inhibitor oxalitinib for second line treatment in patients with PVERA, with primary endpoint being composite reduction of spleen volume and hematocrit control. As you can see, it was accomplished in 21% of patients. Separately, reduction of spleen volume by 35% was seen in almost 40% of patients, and 60% of patients uh, could accomplish hematocrit control with this treatment. This is a potent anti inflammatory medication. And one of the side effects may be infections, including herpes zoster. So we recommend Shingrex vaccine to all of our patients on ruxolitinib. Another uh, side effect can be non-melanoma skin cancers, which uh, has increased incidence in ruxolitinib users, but also in uh, hydroxyurea users. So I refer all my patients for uh, dermatol regular dermatological evaluations. So uh, we looked at five-year relative survival probability for PV patients in the United States. Uh, uh, these are patients who were diagnosed between 2001 and 2011 with end of observation in 2016. And as you can see, this five-year relative survival, unfortunately, is not getting better. So we need new drugs uh, which uh, uh, may improve survival uh, by modifying the disease. Uh, so this um, uh, study uh, looked at new uh, interferon formulation, so-called ROPEG 
interferon. Uh, this is a European study, uh, phase three trial comparing ROPEG interferon against hydroxyurea in high-risk uh, PV patient frontline treatment. Uh, the goal of the study was to show non-inferiority of ROPEG uh, uh, to hydroxyurea. And at one year, interestingly enough, they did not uh, accomplish that primary endpoint. Uh, the hydroxyurea was superior from the standpoint of uh, inducing complete hematological responses, uh, as well as uh, you can see here, molecular responses at six months were higher among patients treated with hydroxyurea. So interferon in general takes time to work. And that's what we observed uh, over the course of the study. So this is the publication which uh, uh, shows data up to you know, three years of follow-up data. And uh, you can see that uh, in the second part of the study, interferon uh, did better from the standpoint of uh, hematological responses, uh, which were statistically significantly better than among patients taking hydroxyurea, as well as uh, uh, molecular responses. And you can see that uh, this uh, is actually improving over time. Uh, this ASH, um, the follow-up of the study, five-year follow-up was presented, showing continues uh, that these trends are continuing, as well as uh, there are no uh, significant new side effects. So this uh, new formulation of the interferon can be given uh, uh, once every three to four weeks um, after the first year of treatment and is now approved uh, in Europe uh, by uh, European Medicines Agency. The company making this medication uh, is bringing, up to the, uh, bringing this to the US market, and uh, it is likely that this uh, medication will become available uh, for our patients next year. So uh, there are a few new treatments I wanted to mention before I end this talk, and uh, uh, there are a uh, few clinical trials we are planning to participate uh, in at, uh, uh, with uh, uh, giving ability to our patients to enroll on this uh, studies, uh, offering uh, new treatments. Uh, some of them may be disease modifying. So first of all, this is the Givinostat, the HDAC inhibitor. Uh, so leading to uh, acetylation of the histone uh, imp uh, and uh, transcriptions uh, of uh, genes uh, uh, responsible for cell growth arrest, differentiation apoptosis. Uh, this drug is uh, uh, gonna be started in a phase three trial against hydroxyurea. Uh, for the frontline treatment of PV patients with high-risk disease. So uh, the other class of drugs which may be interesting is MDM2 inhibitors. As you know, MDM2 uh, inhibits P uh, TP53 function, and by inhibiting MDM2, we're allowing TP53 to perform uh, its role uh, in the malignant cell. Uh, by the way, interferon, one of the uh, mechanisms of action of interferon would be activations of genes uh, increasing transcription of TP53. So uh, the last study I want to mention, uh, phase two trial of uh, hepcidin analog. It's uh, nice to see after discovery of hepcidin 20 years ago that we have an analog uh, and you know, we now have a test we can check for hepcidin, very expensive. I never was able to do it, but now we also have a drug uh, uh, which uh, basically shuts down transport of iron uh, and uh, locks it in the cells. And uh, this drug um, uh, is used for patients with PVR who need phlebotomies. And uh, in an attempt to avoid iron deficiency, which may have uh, detrimental effects on quality of life. Uh, the preliminary results which of phase two study, which were presented at ASH uh, a week ago, were quite promising, no side effects, and pretty much everyone on this drug uh, does not require phlebotomies anymore. So I would like to conclude that uh, polycythemia vera is driven by JAK2 V617F mutation in the majority of cases in 97%. Sugar intake increases and coffee intake decreases the risk of polycythemia vera development. In fact, uh, consumption of coffee, uh, moderate amounts, uh, can be considered uh, part of normal lifestyle. Uh, increased white cell count is associated with PV evolution to post-PV myelofibrosis MDS and AML. Use of statins should be considered in PV patients for uh, cardiovascular uh, disease risk reduction. Hydroxyurea is safe and effective, but interferon holds promise to be disease modifying and novel treatments to prevent or delay disease transformation are needed. Uh, at the end, I would like to acknowledge funding from the Frederick A. DeLuca Foundation, uh, Yale Copper Center, allowing us to conduct the studies and my collaborators. Thank you very much. Well, Nikolai, absolutely superb. Um, oh, you can't see my coffee. Cheers with coffee right now. <laughs> this is I'm really getting fantastic. my very soon. <laughs>
Yeah, I think we just have a, maybe um, time for just one or two questions because um, we want to give Tuma his time. Um, so are you thinking, right? So for example, in the other myeloproductive disorder, chronic myelogenous leukemia, right? we're thinking about cure. We want to get people off these long years of medication. Do you foresee something like that for polycythemia vera? You know, you would hope that there is no driver and in inhibiting it uh, will uh, cure these patients. But unfortunately, right now with uh, uh, ruxolitinib, um, which is an, an inhibitor of JAK2, uh, we don't really see that. In fact, it is not disease modifying uh, if you ask me that. You know, So um, uh, unfortunately, the successes we had in CML did not translate to pH negative MPNs. But you know, we have promising future medications, so perhaps we'll have something which is going to uh, decrease or eliminate the difference in survival our PV patients have when compared to regular population. Okay. Um, let's see, we have a comment from Amr. Great talk and many new exciting options available for these patients. So that was a Thank you, Amr. question. I Just share your enthusiasm. <laughs> it is actually very challenging to do study for these patients because they have such a good prognosis comparing to all other cancer patients. So you really have to have drugs which are not only working well, but also well tolerated. Yeah, excellent. Well, hematology is going to be around for many, many more years. Um, so thank you, Nicola. I think we should move on with uh, um, with Thomas' talk. So let me introduce Dr. Thomas Prebi. He's associate professor of medicine and the medical director and firm chief of operations and quality. And I think everybody knows that Thomas, with the entire Smilo team, has gotten the heme malignancy service through the first surge of COVID and now the second surge. So thank you, Thomas, for that. Um, Thomas also serves as the disease aligned research team or direct leader for myeloid malignancies. And uh, Thomas um, completed his doctorate in hematology oncology in Lyon, France, and then joined the Institut Pauli Calmet in Marseille in France. And he completed a fellowship at Johns Hopkins University as a Fulbright alumnus. And I think that's how eventually we got Thomas to join us here. So Thomas is focused on, again, myeloid malignancies, leukemia. Um, and I think his talk will speak for his amazing expertise in um, treating these diseases and taking care of patients. So Thomas, it's all yours. Hope that everybody is uh, uh, seeing my screen now. OK, so. Um, for today, I want to focus uh, my uh, presentation on uh, uh, one uh, on the topic of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome and more precisely on uh, the patient um, exposed to hypomediating agent and uh, who experienced uh, hypomediating agent uh, uh, failure. Um, so here are my uh, disclosures. And uh, to start, I uh, wanted just to, to uh, do a, a really quick reminder on myelodysplastic um, uh, syndrome, uh, stressing uh, that uh, we have with this disease a really heterogeneous group of uh, clonal bone marrow uh, neoplasms. Uh, we have the cytopenias uh, due to the uh, ineffective hematopoiesis. Uh, we have abnormal blood and bone marrow cell morphology. Uh, and a risk of uh, clonal evolution and progression to um, acute uh, myeloid uh, leukemia. Um, from a molecular standpoint, uh, these uh, disease um, are uh, extremely heterogeneous uh, with uh, some main uh, driver uh, spliceosome uh, mutations such as the uh, FF3V1 mutation, um, epigenetic targeted mutation, uh, such as at uh, TET2, for example, and DMT3A. Um, and this heterogeneity is also something we see in uh, the prognosis. I'm not going to go in the details of the risk stratification of myelodysplastic syndrome, but I just want uh, you to focus your attention on uh, the right uh, side of uh, the panel, where you would see that uh, when we see a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome in clinic, uh, we can see someone who has a median overall survival of more than eight years, as well as uh, people that uh, in uh, the worst case scenario can progress to leukemia and uh, die uh, within a year. And so addressing this heterogeneity is uh, something that is on your mind each time we're seeing patients. Uh, from 
the treatment standpoint, um, we can go from a pure um, observation uh, for patients without any uh, uh, symptoms or uh, significant cytokinia uh, to some low intensity treatment such as um, erythropoietin stimulating agent for patients with anemia. Uh, but in the context of the high risk uh, disease, uh, the mainstay of treatment has been to use hypomethylating uh, agent, namely as a cytidine or decytobin over the last uh, few years. And for the few patient um, eligible, allogenic stem cell transplantation is obviously something that we would consider uh, frontline. Uh, that's a pretty classic uh, for all um, MDS talk. That's basically the uh, uh, registration study uh, uh, of azacitidine in uh, um, MDS showing uh, that uh, with um, ASA, uh, we are um, able uh, to uh, prolong the median overall survival of uh, probably nine months in median as compared to conventional uh, uh, care. Um, we definitely have evidence that the uh, 24 uh, months of median overall survival that we see in this study are probably a bit uh, uh, overestimated as compared to what we see in uh, uh, real life, uh, probably uh, around um, 18 months. And that's many works from uh, basically the um, uh, registry studies such as the Group Francophone de Myelodysplasie, but also some really nice work of Stephen Armour, for example, on uh, CS uh, uh, data. So what do we call hypomethylating agent uh, failure? Because we know that um, at the end, uh, 90 to 95% of the patient that we start treating with this hypomethylating agent will experience some degree of failure. Uh, we classically define that as a lack of response or a progression after at least four to six cycle of um, uh, hypomethylating agent. There's no difference between uh, azacitidine or uh, uh, decided to be from this uh, uh, standpoint. And um, one of the main features that we see is a really, really limited overall survival for uh, patients experiencing failure of the treatment with um, in average uh, uh, four to six months uh, median survival. And that's something that, as, uh, that we initially described uh, almost 10 years ago, and that has been since uh, reproduced in many uh, different uh, studies. So, Interestingly, um, we have many reasons why uh, this uh, hypomethylating agent resistance can uh, develop. But so far, um, we can't say that we have a home run. We don't, can't say that we have a unifying theory uh, to explain why we have this uh, uh, failure of this hypomethylating agent. We see phenomenon of clonal selection and clonal evolution, maybe potentially uh, with some difference of profiling between the patient that are completely refractory to the disease in the patient that responds and then uh, uh, progress after treatment. Uh, but many other mechanisms have been potentially uh, put on the table as explaining what we see. Autophagy defect, a change in uh, uh, nucleosidic analog transporter, um, expression of immune checkpoint inhibitors and uh, regulators. And we will we'll circle back on that uh, later in the presentation. So for the moment, there's still a lot of uh, open question on uh, explaining this hypomethylating agent uh, uh, failure. There's obviously also something that is uh, pretty clear, which is the role of the uh, uh, stem cell quiescence uh, and uh, uh, resistance. Uh, MDS are stem, uh, stem cell diseases. And even in responding patient, um, for example, who correct their uh, hemoglobin and that have a decrease in their uh, blast count, like here in the, in the blue line, we can still detect uh, cytogenetics abnormality. And uh, more interestingly, we can still detect stem cells uh, like LTCICs, for example, that harbors a marker of the uh, myelodysplastic uh, uh, syndrome. And so that's something that is important when it comes to the way we're considering treatment, not only for relapse, but on a more general uh, basis from the, uh, from the, from the get-go on the diagnosis of this patient. Uh, let's talk about treatment now. Um, we reviewed a few years ago um, what were the, uh, the options uh, for this patient with standard of care treatment. And let's say that nothing is really satisfying uh, with the, the exception of the few uh, patients that can potentially transition to analogenic uh, stem cell transplantation 
either directly after relapse or, for example, after uh, intensive uh, uh, cytoreduction uh, with chemotherapy. So there have been a lot of uh, basically investigation around uh, what uh, we can do when it comes to intensive treatment, brute force approaches for HMA failure. Uh, we try to dig deeper a bit on the data that we initially generated on induction as we may have uh, a lot of different uh, type of induction we can potentially uh, use in this uh, context. Conventional seven plus three regimen like we would be doing in uh, um, uh, newly diagnosed AML, intermediate to high dose uh, uh, cytarabine regimen, and that's something we're doing mostly on the European side, as well as purine analog uh, based uh, regimen such as FLAG or FLAG IDA uh, that uh, we see on both uh, uh, sides of, uh, of the Atlantic. And so we gathered basically uh, um, a group of uh, 15 different uh, um, uh, investigator uh, Euro and in uh, US and put together uh, basically a, a data set of 307 patients with myelodysplastic syndrome uh, treated with induction chemotherapy. We found that roughly 41% of the patient will achieve a complete uh, uh, remission with only a median overall uh, survival of uh, 11 uh, months. Uh, the two take home message from this work that uh, we uh, developed at Yale here with Brian Ball uh, a few years ago was one that we do not saw any real significant difference between the conventional 7 plus 3, the intensive IDAC uh, regimen, or uh, the uh, fludarabine or clofarabine based uh, uh, regimen. And I think also, um, uh, pretty importantly, that all patients uh, that did not have the chance to bridge to analogic transplantation died within a year of uh, the initiation of treatment. So that's pretty telling on the fact that we definitely need to develop uh, more option for uh, this patient, uh, including from the initiation of response, but also on the transplant to make sure that we can maximize access uh, uh, to transplant for um, all of these uh, patients. Um, one of the extension and one of the uh, uh, development following this initial study was to maybe try to use a better drug for induction uh, chemo, uh, chemotherapy for this patient. And um, we had uh, CPX351, the liposomal formulation of donomycin and cytarabine uh, that was uh, approved uh, two years ago, three years ago now. Uh, for acute myeloid leukemia arising from myelodysplastic syndrome. And so uh, always thinking about these uh, intensive approaches, uh, that was a kind of a natural conclusion to basically uh, try to use uh, a pretty uh, similar drug uh, to um, achieve response in HMA-resistant uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, that's a phase two study that uh, we uh, developed with uh, uh, Prajwal Bodu. Uh, at uh, Yale uh, as a multi-center uh, IIT. And um, the plan is basically to give uh, two cycles of induction with uh, two days of CPX. In acute myeloid leukemia, uh, uh, we usually use three days of CPX for um, induction, but there's some data showing that from a safety standpoint, especially in elderly patient, uh, two days may be uh, probably more um, appropriate. And for patients that are responding, um, uh, we can continue for six cycle of uh, maintenance with one day of CPX or transition uh, to bone marrow transplantation. The study is uh, open to accrual after the uh, uh, COVID adventures uh, that we had over the last year and um, uh, we're up and running. So uh, all this non-selected approach, induction chemotherapy, but also uh, basically a non-targeted agent that we have developed over the years uh, for the moment, let's say that we have not found any uh, real uh, good candidate to be a standard of care option, um, especially for patients that are not eligible for um, aggressive uh, chemo. I've just listed here um, a few of the uh, studies, but as you can see, uh, in lots of these general studies without any uh, real uh, targeting, we're in a situation where the response rates are low, and more importantly, the uh, overall survival uh, seems still uh, stuck uh, below, uh, below one year. So we definitely need uh, to do uh, better. Uh, 
And that goes back to uh, uh, the way we're considering the pathophysiology of this disease uh, and acknowledge that uh, this HMA failure are not an homogeneous uh, situation. Uh, just, to, just to give an example, we see that um, uh, from just a clinical standpoint, we see different of outcome in patients that are primary refractory and uh, really do not respond at all uh, to uh, hypomediating agent and patient with relapsing disease uh, that basically seem to have a bit more favorable outcome uh, in uh, this uh, context. So still a lot, lot of work to do on the translational and uh, basic science side. Uh, one way we've tried to tackle this difference of outcome based on this uh, clinical finding uh, was to uh, deal with the uh, stable disease with a slightly different term uh, than just uh, using uh, um, regular uh, treatment uh, by adding on, on the uh, hypomethylating agent, uh, potentially drug that may be uh, synergistic based on their mode of action or based on in vitro uh, studies. Um, we had several attempts at this uh, uh, over the last years. An easy combination and logical combination was to add on the hypomethylating agent, the second epigenetic targeted agent, uh, such as uh, HDAC inhibitor. Then uh, we treated uh, 19 patients uh, with uh, Vorinostat, which is one of the first in class uh, HDAC inhibitor, uh, with unfortunately pretty um, uh, limited outcome a really low salvage rate of only 10%, but a median survival of uh, 12 months in potentially a pretty selected uh, population. We also tried to use uh, a bit more recently, and that's not uh, fully published yet, uh, the addition of a smooth inhibitor to try to use, uh, really work on the stem cell uh, component. There's some in vitro data showing that this smooth inhibitor can potentially uh, um, abrogate the uh, resistance to hypomediating agent, uh, but so far the results were uh, pretty uh, disappointing to me. Well, not to be completely gloom, there's end at the uh, 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 there's probably a light at the end of the tunnel. I, I need to uh, highlight uh, the work presented by Amer a few uh, a year ago, basically at the Ash meeting on the add-on of uh, venetoclax in a maybe a less selected. Uh, population, 24 patients um, ASA uh, resistant with this addition of the BCL2 uh, inhibitor, some real complete uh, remission and some marrow uh, uh, leukemia free state uh, with a six months uh, progression free survival of 76%. Uh, that from our standard is uh, pretty, uh, pretty promising. So stay tuned, we will have uh, more uh, information, but that's one of the avenues that we are currently uh, investigating. So that's pretty good. That's basically uh, based on a combination of mode of action. Uh, that's still not something that really addressed the specificity of the clone of the myelodysplastic uh, uh, syndrome. And maybe instead of using brute force to try to in, uh, induce a response, we can maybe try to outsmart the disease. Uh, rather than uh, just uh, using uh, dose intensity or uh, uh, non-selected approaches. Uh, in the context of myelodysplastic syndrome, we are a bit less fortunate than in the acute myeloid world as we don't have so many targeted agents uh, that uh, we can use. Uh, the majority of the patient will have SF3B1, TET2, SRSF2 mutation uh, that are for the moment at least uh, non-targetable, even if there's some uh, basically development on the side. And I'm going to take the, uh, the example of uh, some project we have done in the, um, in the IDH world. Uh, and that can potentially be avenues that we are going to explore in the future to try to, to get uh, a better outcome for um, these patients. So uh, we have this IDH inhibitor that are basically allosteric inhibitors from IDH2 and IDH1. Uh, IDH2, that's uh, inacetinib. IDH1, that's ivocetinib. Um, in uh, uh, both of the phase one study uh, of these uh, 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 compounds, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome uh, patients were allowed after at least one line of treatment. 76% uh, of the patients seems to be able to, to respond uh, with the IDH2, uh, uh, sorry, 59% uh, of the patients seems to be able to respond uh, to uh, IDH2 uh, inhibitor and maybe a bit more uh, in uh, the IDH1 uh, subclone with a 71% uh, 
uh, response rate. As you can see, that's pretty small samples of patients. There's uh, ongoing investigation with this IDH um, uh, inhibitor um, single agent or combination. The one thing that is pretty striking is the fact that uh, we're probably in a situation where the duration of response is still uh, pretty uh, limited. So potentially, we can try to find some alternative to uh, IDH inhibitor in this context. And uh, that's potentially when I was mentioning outsmarting the disease. I'm not the smart guy, uh, but I had the chance uh, and, uh, to work with really uh, intelligent people, Ranjit Bindra, Stephanie Allen, for example. And um, you may know the story that uh, was developed by Ranjit over the last uh, years about uh, the fact that uh, when you have an IDH uh, mutation that was initially uh, uh, basically uh, uh, developed and found in uh, gliomas, the fact of adding this uh, two hydroxy uh, glutarate will basically impair the uh, activity of the exo uh, exo oh, oxygenase in uh, the cell, uh, decrease uh, homologous uh, recombination uh, repair, and create a brackenous uh, phenotype. Uh, that obviously is interesting uh, as a potentially chemo uh, uh, radio sensitizer, but from all standpoint, we were especially interested in how potentially we can use uh, POP inhibitors to create uh, uh, synthetic lethality uh, with uh, this uh, agent. And when we tested, basically, when we move from uh, gliomas to uh, uh, leukemias and myelodysplastic syndromes, indeed, that's what we found, that we were able uh, to potentially uh, um, uh, induce apoptosis in samples of patients that were exposed to hypomethylating agent, that were exposed uh, to um, IDH uh, inhibitor. And that uh, came to uh, development with um, uh, NCI a study right now of the um, Olaparib, the first in class uh, IDH um, um, uh, POP um, inhibitor uh, for patient harboring uh, IDH uh, mutation. So that's patient that has a diagnosis of acute myeloleukemias or myelodysplastic syndrome with an IDH1 or IDH2 uh, uh, mutation and uh, at least one prior line of uh, treatment, including in lot of these patients um, uh, hypomethylating uh, agents. There are four cohorts that uh, are currently uh, investigated. Uh, one for patients with IDH1, IDH2 mutant AML without prior exposure to IDH inhibitor. Um, one uh, with uh, myelodysplastic syndrome without exposure to IDH inhibitor and uh, ARM2 and ARM4 are for patients uh, in acute myeloleukemias and myelodysplastic syndrome that were already exposed to um, IDH uh, inhibitor. In the patient that are naive of IDH inhibitor, we have an early uh, response assessment after one cycle. And if we do not see any clear uh, clinical benefit, these patients are usually discontinued and uh, transition to uh, uh, classical IDH inhibitor. For the patient that are responding or the patient that were previously exposed to hypomediating, uh, to hypomediating agent, agent and IDH inhibitor, we are reassessing our response after three, six, nine, and uh, uh, 12 uh, cycles, continuing the treatment until uh, progression. The study has been activated this year, uh, and uh, we're pretty happy to have, over the last uh, few months, three patients included and in treatment, and uh, three patients in screening right now. Um, one of the uh, big interests of this work is also to um, uh, see the uh, pretty extensive uh, uh, collaboration we have from a translational standpoint. Uh, that's collaboration with the um, uh, NCI uh, through MOCA for well exome sequencing and RNA sequencing. That's a lot of study done in-house at Yale uh, with Ranjit and Stephanie uh, to uh, explore um, uh, from ex vivo samples uh, DNA uh, damage response, but also all these uh, cells will behave uh, put in the Mr. G mice model uh, that Stephanie uh, is uh, uh, developing. Uh, we have collaboration with Kamanos, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Pat LaRusso, uh, and that's collaboration with Jing Li uh, to assess the evolution of the two hydroxyglutarate uh, and some metabolomics marker. And right now, uh, we are starting, starting to work uh, with Green Wang from the uh, uh, West Campus on single cell sequencing uh, for uh, these um, specific uh, uh, samples and uh, studies, as we definitely think that uh, we will have some clonal selection as potentially one of the mechanisms of resistance 
uh, in uh, this uh, context. So stay tuned, that's a bit early to make any, any conclusion. We have just have a few patients and a few months on treatment, uh, but that's a developing story. Uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, one of the things that has also been uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, as a mechanism of resistance, and I try to go fast on that, is uh, immunologic escape of the myelodysplastic uh, syndrome. We have an overexpression of PD-1, PD-L1, and CTLA-4 uh, in uh, patients um, with hypomediating agent failure, and that led to uh, several, uh, several uh, studies. I'm mentioning here studies with uh, basically EP Nevo or uh, uh, Pembro. Uh, I also need obviously to, to mention there's a study uh, led by Amer uh, with basically HDAC inhibitors plus checkpoint blockade inhibitors uh, that was recently uh, published. For the moment, let's say that we are not at the point where it's a game changer. There may be some sign of response, but for the moment, uh, nothing that is really uh, uh, perfect. So still a lot of work uh, to do. One way we thought about that is potentially to try to bring this uh, 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 potentially uh, a checkpoint uh, inhibitor uh, earlier in the development. And for instance, we're currently developing a study in an MDS and AML uh, of um, uh, ivacetinib IDH1 inhibitor plus nivolumab um, in uh, a phase one uh, pilot uh, study for patients that were already uh, exposed to uh, chemotherapy or uh, hypomediating um, agent. Uh, the study has been on all and has to be uh, restructured uh, because of uh, COVID, but we are back in business and open to accrual uh, or since basically uh, last, uh, last week. Once again, uh, translation and collective studies are really important, and we have some ongoing collaboration with Stephanie and uh, Guilin Wang. So if I need to, to summarize a bit uh, uh, where we are really quickly, uh, for the moment, for this patient with hypomethylating agent failure, we're still in a situation where aggressive management uh, for transplant, uh, allergenic transplant candidate makes sense, as we don't have any really uh, reliable other option besides maybe some targeted therapy uh, on a small number of patients, we do not have a reliable standard of care for patients and fit uh, uh, for treatment. Maybe even etoclax, maybe some other drug will come and will be confirmed as option, but for the moment that's still uh, pretty struggling. Uh, the way uh, the uh, field is moving uh, is interesting and we are learning a lot from the um, IML world at the same time, uh, we probably cannot really completely extrapolate everything we do from the uh, uh, AML side. Uh, we know that uh, the microenvironment, for example, in myelodysplastic syndrome is definitely different. We know that uh, the ability of this patient to sustain any aggressive treatment is definitely less than what we see in AML or in other uh, uh, malignancies. So uh, that's uh, something that we need to work on. And so. The best way we have to, to deal with this HMA failure is really to try to, to avoid it and optimize the frontline treatment. We have lots of currently uh, really exciting drugs uh, in the uh, pipeline. Um, lots of data that are presented at the ASH this year on venetoclax, uh, magrolimab, TIM3 inhibitor, and um, AMR has been uh, part of uh, uh, some of these um, uh, studies. So stay tuned. The MDS field is really moving, and we hope to see the type of change in uh, landscape that we have seen over uh, the last year in um, acute myeloid uh, leukemias. So in conclusion, this, this situation of um, hypomediating agent failure really represents some academic challenges. We need to improve our understanding of the physiology, uh, pathophysiology of this uh, situation to be able to help us to better define the standard of care for this patient. We need to build resources. We need to build repository and longitudinal follow-up for this patient, which is sometimes challenging um, in the context of a disease that is tra treated in both small and big uh, centers. We need to collaborate among uh, academics to be able to uh, really have significant number of patients to be able to answer uh, the right question. I also think that it's important to keep in mind uh, that there are some clinical care challenges for that. Uh, the access to innovation to center of excellence is not something that is homogenous uh, in the country or just homogenous in Connecticut. And that's definitely one of the mission I think we have 
uh, at Yale to be able to promote the access to innovation and promote the access uh, to the center of um, excellence um, that, that we have. Um, we know that patients in Connecticut, with or without snowstorm, like tomorrow, <laughs> will have potentially some, uh, some issues uh, limiting their ability to, to uh, basically uh, get to uh, uh, academic centers, get to clinical trial. And so I think that uh, one of the mission that we have as academics is also to make sure that we can potentially bring research, bring um, um, basically new uh, therapy and exciting therapy to the different uh, sites where the patients are treated uh, close to their uh, home. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, um, that participated to this effort. For sure, the Yale Cancer Center group alphabetically, Steve Gore, uh, my uh, mentor, Stephanie, uh, for a lot of collaboration, Nikolai, Rory, and Amer uh, for being such trooper and uh, such a great group to, to work with. Uh, my dear colleagues, colleagues from the group Francophone des Mielodysplasies, as well as collaborators in uh, US, uh, Europe, and no, I should say in UK. I should probably split UK and Europe now. I mean, a few weeks. Uh, anyway, uh, on that, I'll take uh, any question. I would like to thank you for uh, your attention. Thanks so much. Well, fantastic, um, Thomas. Thank you so much. Um, really, tour de force um, and MDS and AML. And, um, you know, as we were, you were presenting, you've actually answered like my burning question, should we just get rid of azacytidine, you know, and use it for salvage after everything else? And um, that will certainly be very exciting to see how you and the whole team are going to come up with exciting trials. Um, I think we're a little bit after the hour, but maybe <laughs> you want to say something to that, or Nicola, do you have a question? <laughs> and then we have to let people go. Fortunately, we're not getting kicked out of the room, <laughs> which is good. No, I think that's uh, definitely, yeah. um, the HMA is a standard of care, but that's not a perfect one. So developing new agents or new formulation, for example, we have now access to uh, oral formulation of uh, these hypomediating agents. That definitely is something that we want to, uh, to continue to develop with the idea that uh, even if we may not improve the, uh, uh, the response rate or the oral survival, and that's maybe something we can discuss as the way we can uh, I use this medication um, is a bit uh, different than conventional hypomediating agent, we can improve quality of life uh, of the mm -hmm. patient uh, and uh, access to care. So that's definitely something that is, uh, that is important for sure. Yeah, fantastic. So Charlie, <laughs> do you want to tell me? We probably have to break. <laughs> no, th thank you, Toma and Nikolai, for two superb talks, really as a tour de force on two important areas of hematologic malignancies. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much and um, look forward to tackling these uh, problems over the years. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye.